Welcome to another edition of The Leaders. I'm Yuli Ismartono from Asia Views. We're in Singapore to have a dialogue with Kishore Mahbubani. Mr. Mahbubani is Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. He began his career as a diplomat, joining the Foreign Service in 1971 and ending as Singapore's ambassador to the United Nations in 2002, where he served as president of the Security Council. In between, he was posted to Cambodia and Malaysia. He is the author of two books, Can Asians Think? and the just published Beyond the Age of Innocence, Rebuilding Trust Between America and the World. Mr. Mabubani received his master's degree in philosophy in 1976 from Dalhousie University in Canada and an honorary doctorate in 1995. Professor Mabubani, thank you for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Let me start by asking the motive behind your well-known, must-read but provocative book, Can Asians Think? Well, the, the motivation was very simple, you know. Uh, you know, Asians uh, would like to believe that they're now successful, uh, but, but I think that they need to think a bit harder uh, about their future prospects, because if you look back of what Asia has accomplished over the last thousand years, it hasn't been a great story, because in the year 1000, Asia was up here, Europe was here, and North America had not been discovered. In the year 2000, North America is here, Europe is here, and Asia is very low. So the question that the Asians need to ask themselves uh, in a very profound fashion is how they lost so many centuries of development. Why is it when the West began to take off in the 17th century, 18th century, and even the 19th century, Asian countries did not uh, copy or emulate the best practices of the West. And it only took the uh, uh, second half of the 20th century, in fact, only the last two decades of the 20th century, that you've seen the Asian country, uh, countries emerging and taking off. Uh, I'm optimistic uh, about Asia's future. But I think we have better grounds for optimism. The Asians do some very hard and very tough-minded reflection on what went wrong uh, in these past few centuries. Because the, the, if you do not figure out all the causes of what went wrong, the danger is that it might happen again. That's why I wrote the book, Can Asians Think, to force Asians to reflect very hard on their condition and what they did wrong, and how they can make it right this time. But aren't you seeing a change, uh, a kind of a renaissance right now? I think you're seeing the beginnings of a renaissance, but uh, I think the Asian countries have so far um, done the easy things. Uh, you know, the first phase of economic development is often the easiest phase. You can pluck the low-lying fruits, you know, like for example, you can bring in foreign investment with low wages and then export to the developed markets and so on and so forth. But as you move up the development ladder uh, and as you have to compete with the developed societies, whether in America or Western Europe, you have to show the same capacity uh, for critical thinking that has enabled these societies to propel forward. And in many Asian societies today, uh, there's so many taboo subjects. You, know, you can't discuss things openly uh, and criti critically, you know. Uh, and that I see is a great weakness, remaining weakness of Asian societies. And, and I hope, again, with my book, uh, Can Asians Think, uh, I'm forcing Asians to ask hard questions, you know, to think very hard and critically about themselves. And I don't think they've arrived at all. Do you think this is cultural? I mean, how can this change? I mean, your book will help, certainly, but what must we do to bring about this kind of change? I think we, don't have to, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> uh, fortunately for us, uh, other societies have succeeded already, and we can learn from the best practices uh, of other societies. And this is happening, I mean, China and India, for example, uh, are learning to apply what I call the, you know, the pillars of Western wisdom, you know, free market economics, for example, 
are being implemented, uh, emphasis on education, uh, emphasis on rule of law, uh, all these are being gradually uh, implemented. But they need to be implemented more systematically. And um, I think the more, um, the more we can learn from the developed societies on what to do right, you know, uh, the faster we can progress. Take rule of law, for example. Okay, I see that as being quite fundamental. It's important that there not be any segment of society, uh, especially the rich and powerful elite. Huh? Uh, as you know, uh, look at Indonesia, for example. Uh, there was a time when uh, President Suharto and his family you know, were immune from any kind of uh, legal process, and that's not healthy for any society. Even the highest person in the land, like in America, the president of America, is not immune from the rule of law. In the same way, the leaders of Asian countries, all Asian countries, should also not be immune from the rule of law. And that, uh, sh that's a, that and, and they should uh, implement that to ensure that societies move forward. Uh, again, I bring up the, the, the question of culture. Mm. Because a lot of people say these are the remnants of uh, a long-standing feudalism that exists in many Asian countries. So how can we change this? Is it do we need a particular s uh, system of education, perhaps? Or? See, I'm glad you brought up the word feudalism because I think that's the critical word, uh, feudalism. What you have in Asian societies are the, the external trappings of modernity. I mean, you have a parliament, you have uh, courts, but the culture is very feudal. And it's very, I mean, the, the, the one of the saddest countries in Southeast Asia, for example, is the Philippines. Now, Philippines, uh, on the surface, is openly democratic, uh, and has the rule of law, and, but as in terms of its culture, uh, it's still very feudal. Uh, with a few families in many ways still controlling the wealth of the country and the people at the very bottom uh, have no ex avenue to grow and develop except to go overseas and work uh, as foreign workers. Whereas uh, once you, once you de-feudalize the societies like India is doing for example, I think it's quite amazing to see the uh, people from the untouchable caste in India like this man Narendra Yadav becoming the chief economist of the Reserve Bank of India. Now, all his ancestors, the only thing they could do was to sweep the streets, you know? And they were not even allowed to touch or shake hands with people in other classes. Now, the India's capacity to get rid of the feudal mindset is liberating a enormous reserves of energy within the Indian body politic, and also ensuring that the brain power that India had in the lower caste, which was lost, is now being used to develop the country. So in the same way, all Southeast Asian societies must get rid of this feudal mentality and see the lower classes not as liabilities to their societies, but as assets. Because these are reserve pools of brain power that have not been used by the societies for their development. But to, but to see that, you have to get rid of the feudal mindset that says only people in the upper class can think. Actually, the people in the bottom classes uh, can think as well uh, as the people in the top classes too.